Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Jason Pfeiffer, who's here to share with us his new book, Build for Tomorrow, an action plan for embracing change, adapting fast, and future-proofing your career. Change in business happens so often. Are you prepared to excel in the next shift? Well, we have the right person today to answer just that question. So Jason Pfeiffer is an author and the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, host of the podcast Build for Tomorrow and Problem Solvers, a keynote speaker, startup advisor, and nonstop optimist machine. His goal is to help you become more resilient and adapt in a world of constant change so you can seize new opportunities before anyone else does. So let's welcome to the show, Jason Pfeiffer. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this book. Oh, my goodness, like what even inspired you to write this? Well, I had noticed through my work as editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine that the thing that seemed to drive success when I was looking at the accomplished entrepreneurs I was meeting, the accomplished leaders, the thing that seemed to drive success across them all was adaptability. It was the ability to see change, which was always happening, as an opportunity. And I got to wondering how that happens. How do people become good at that? Because it's definitely not something you're born with. It's a skill you can learn. And the pandemic turned out to be an incredibly instructive moment because we all got to see everybody go through the same change at the exact same time. And then radically diverge in what they were doing. And some people tried to cling as hard as they could to what they felt they were losing. And other people started to very proactively, or well, I guess not proactively because nobody could have predicted it, but actively redefine themselves and their work. And I wanted to know what it was that they were doing and how they were doing that because it felt like if I could understand that and share that, then I had something really valuable to offer everybody who was going through an endless series of changes. Well, in your book, you talk about the four phases of change. How did you find that and where did that come from? You know, it came from watching people go through radical change. I realized that even the most accomplished people, were experiencing some kind of panic, but they were doing something different with the panic at the very beginning. It was really, really interesting. I'll give you an example. In the very early days, I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I remember, and I bet a lot of people remember, the last social thing that you did before COVID changed everything. You know, Do you remember that for yourself? And the last social thing that I did was I went out to a friend's birthday dinner at a crowded restaurant. And I, you know, we were all passing around our hand sanitizer, thinking that that was going to stop any kind of uh, illness because nobody knew what was going on. And I was talking to this woman named Megan, who is the founder and CEO of a trade show company called Founder Made. And so they host live events, live trade shows. And I've spoken at a couple of them. And I said to her, Megan, I said, what are you going to do? Because it seems like live events are shutting down and you're a live events business. And she said, I'm actually really excited about this moment because we have had all of these ideas for other lines of revenue for our business. And we've never been able to explore them because all of our resources and energy keep having to be put towards the live events. But if the live events disappear, well, now we have time to explore these things that we had never had time to explore before. And originally when I heard this, I thought this is a person who is not afraid. This is a person who is so poised that she is not panicking. And I then, of course, as we got into COVID, I saw a lot of people who were doing exactly that were paralyzed, were panicking. And then eventually I realized, and I thought about Megan a lot, and eventually I realized, no, she was panicking, but she was fearing something different. A lot of people fear loss. They fear loss. They fear the loss of the thing that they already have. Megan understood that there was a solution ahead of her. 
something always comes next. There will be something, some needs, some changes. People will need things from her. There will be opportunities in the future. The thing she was fearing was not losing what she already had. The thing she was fearing was not recognizing the next opportunity fast enough. And that was propelling her forwards instead of backwards. And I started to think, Everybody goes through panic, but they start to use that panic in different ways. But either way, no matter how long it takes you, the next thing you're going to do eventually is figure out how to adapt. And once you start adapting, you start to put some new pieces together and you build a new normal, something new that's familiar, some kind of new foundation. And then eventually you reach what I like to call the wouldn't go back moment, that moment where you say, I have something so new and valuable that I wouldn't want to go back to a time before I had it. I think that if we can recognize that that is part of the journey ahead of us, that we will get there, that the wait, the wouldn't go back moment is waiting for us all. It empowers us. It emboldens us to move through those earlier phases faster, to do what Megan did and think, how can this moment of sheer terror and panic propel me forwards rather than becoming obsessed with what I'm losing and trying to look and hold on to what's backwards? What a great example of being able to move forward and so unique too, because I think a lot of times people do get stuck in that, that fear and that panic, and they're not quite sure how to make this transition to embracing change. Yeah, it's very, very hard. Let me be clear. It's incredibly hard. And it's okay that it's hard. And it's hard for me. I've had to go through it many times myself. And the thing that I think people should do right now, whether you're going through a big moment of change or just to prepare yourself for the change that will come, because let's be clear, something fundamental will change about your work or your life. It's just will. We don't live in static worlds. Is that you can spend time trying to ident identify and understand what and who you are and the value that you provide to the world that is distinct from the role that you occupy or the tasks that you do every day. I think we are tying our identities way too close to the role that we occupy or the tasks that we do every day. So, you know, if someone comes up to you at a party and says, what do you do? Your answer is going to be one of those things. It's going to be the role you occupy or the tasks that you do every day. You're either going to be like, oh, I'm the, you know, I do this job or I work at this company or I do this kind of thing, which is fine. It's fine. It's not, it's not a bad answer. I answer that way too. But if that's the only way that you identify yourself, it's that, if that's how you tie your identity, then when those things change and they will, then you aren't just experiencing a change to your work. You're experiencing a change to your identity. That feels very scary. So the starting point I would suggest is think about for yourself. And in my book, Build for Tomorrow, I have a exercise for how to do this, but I'll just tell you the punchline. Think about for yourself how you could write a single sentence, a mission statement for yourself, a short sentence, try to keep it under 10 words, in which it's the, word, the first word is I, and then every word after that is carefully selected because it is not anchored to something that is easily changeable. I know that sounds abstract, so I'll just give you my example. I am a magazine editor. I used to be a newspaper reporter. I also am a podcast host and a speaker. I do all sorts of things. But my sentence for myself is, I tell stories in my own voice. Seven words. Why? I tell stories, stories, carefully selected word, not magazines, not magazine editing. Why? Because if, I, if my identity is I'm a magazine editor, well, you know what? I don't own Entrepreneur Magazine where I work. I'm an employee of Entrepreneur Magazine. They could fire me tomorrow. They could fire me right now as I'm talking to you. I could check my email and it turns out that I'm gone. And if my identity is I'm a magazine editor, I'm one phone call or email away from losing my identity. Nothing is stopping my boss from firing me. That's a dangerous place to be. I don't like that instability. So I tell stories, stories. Now I'm picking a word that is not easily changeable that I have control over. I'm telling stories right now. I do it every single day in lots of different ways. I could continue to do it in new ways that I haven't even thought of right now. And then in my own voice, those words are me setting the terms for how I want to operate at this phase of my career. We can change the mission statement, but I'm telling you that if you step back and start to think, what is the sentence for you? You will start to recognize that you have transferable value, that you have something that you love to do, 
something you're good at, something that you can do for others, that you can find infinite ways to do that so that if one thing changes, if the way that your work changes, if you get laid off or fired, whatever the case is, that you can say there are other ways to do this singular thing because the singular thing has not changed. That could be, I love building things. I like solving complex problems. I help teams achieve greatness. I help people find what they love. Whatever the case is for yourself, once you recognize that and really embody it and live it, you will recognize that the way that you're doing it now is just one way to do it. And when change comes, that's okay. So does a lot of this have to do with changing our perspective on when things happen? Instead of going into this place of panic, we kind of sit back, look at it a little bit more rationally and and decide, okay, change is happening. I'm, I've got to go flow, you know, do a flow with this. Yeah, it's about understanding that change can create opportunity and then giving yourself the frameworks to recognize that you are more flexible than you've realized, and that this moment of change presents new opportunities too. I mean, you know, think about it this way. When something changes, it doesn't just change for you. It changes for other people too. I mean, right now, for example, we are going through a very unpredictable economy. And that is creating a lot of change for a lot of people. Industries are contracting. People are losing their jobs. They're very worried about losing their jobs. People's finances are in flux or unanticipated. Well, okay, if that's happening to you, that can feel very scary. But consider that it is happening to other people too. And what does that mean? That means that they are in need. It means that they have problems. And maybe you can solve them. And maybe the people who they usually turn to to solve their problems, whatever that is, either individuals or companies that have products or services, that maybe they are no longer exactly what these people need right now. You could start to offer your services. You could start a business. Or you could just refashion yourself into a, a person who, who presents in a, you know, presents their skills in a different way or explores new opportunities that maybe you have something that uh, a company needs that you didn't think of before. Um, and once you start to think about it like this, that you are not just a person who is experiencing the change yourself, but rather that you are a person who can be a solution to other people's change, then we really start to think about how we can find great new opportunities in times of disruption. And there are a lot of things that you can do as well to start to prepare yourself for that. And maybe we should talk about that, which means, for example, that it's not just about understanding yourself, but it's also about constantly being aware of the skills that you have and the skills that you can build. Because, I don't know, I mean, you've probably throughout your career um, developed one set of skill, but at the same time, realized that you know, whatever the next step is that you need in your career are going to require other skills, right? I mean, and and mm -hmm. and so you have to start thinking, well, how do I position myself? When do I learn those things? Because if you don't, then you're never going to get where it is that you want to go. I don't know. Does that resonate? Because I have a whole, I have a whole way in which I have reoriented my own career around that exact realization. And it did not come easy and figuring out what to do with it didn't come easy. But once I got it, it changed how I approach everything. I find that fascinating because a lot of people do get stuck in you know, I was doing this one thing for my career and now I'm having to make a change. And how difficult is that? Yeah. Here's here's what I here's what I would like people to think about. In front of you right now, literally, right now, everybody who's listening to this, without exception, right now, there are two sets of opportunities in front of you. I like to think of them as opportunity set A, opportunity set B. Opportunity set A is everything that is asked of you. So if you have a job and you have a boss and that boss expects you to do things and you're going to be measured on how well you do those things, that's opportunity set A. Do a good job. Then there's opportunity set B. Opportunity set B is everything that's available to you that nobody's asking you to do. And that could be at your job. 
That could be new skills that you develop. That could be joining a new team, taking on new responsibilities. But it could also be things that are outside of your job. It could be that you like listening to podcasts, and so you go and start a podcast. It could be that you always wanted to be really good as a public speaker, and so you put yourself into a position where you're going to learn that thing. Maybe you take some classes in public speaking or debate, whatever the case is. That's opportunity set B, doing the thing that nobody is asking you to do, but that is available to you. My argument to you is that opportunity set B, the things that are available to you that nobody's asking you to do, always more important, infinitely more important than opportunity set A, which is not to say that opportunity set A, doing the things that are asked of you is unimportant. Obviously, it is important. You have to do a good job or you'll get fired. We need income. But if you only focus on the things that are asked of you, then you will only be qualified to do the things that you're already doing. But opportunity set B is where growth happens, where you push yourself out of the things that you are typically doing, where you push yourself out of the things that are right in front of you, and you say, I am going to develop what I need next. You may not even need to know how or where it's going to lead you. You may not know what the ROI, the return on investment is for this. But I am telling you that if you commit yourself to developing new skills right now, you will open doors in the future that you cannot anticipate. Do you know why I, for example, am the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, which, you know, was a, I, I had aspired for a long time to be editor-in-chief of a, of a national magazine, and doing this has absolutely changed my life and career, having this opportunity. And when I think back on what are the things that helped me get there, one of the things, which I could not have anticipated, is that years and years and years prior, I was working at a different magazine called Fast Company, and I was a mid-level editor on the print side. My job was to edit print magazine stories. And then we created a video department at the magazine, uh, Fast Company. And um, and although nobody asked me to be part of the video department, I decided to volunteer to get in front of the camera and host like a regular segment. And I, I, I was okay, but the director saw something in me and kept giving me feedback and advice. And I kept improving and improving. And I thought, what is the point of this exactly? I'm not getting paid anymore to do this. but. I am learning something, and I think that that's valuable. I just don't know how. Now, how was it valuable? Uh, you know, for a while, it was not really valuable. It was fun. Nobody gave me a TV show. I didn't make any more money off of it. But because I was good on camera at Fast Company, I was also able to go on television. And it made it easier for me to go on radio. And it gave me a way of speaking that helped me be good as a podcast host. And then years later, when I was in a position to interview to become editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, a goal that I had aspired to, not specifically an entrepreneur, but I wanted to be editor in chief somewhere. One of the things that the president and CEO really liked about me was that I could represent the brand well as the face of the brand. They could put me on TV. They could put me out on stage. Why? Because I was really good at it. Why? Because years ago, I had stood in front of that camera at Fast Company when nobody asked me to do it, and I learned a skill. Turns out that skill paid off in a way I couldn't have anticipated, but I might not have the job that I have now had back then I not pursued this thing that nobody asked me to do and that I didn't even know what the value of it was. That is the reason why we pursue things. That's the reason why we cannot settle for just doing a good job at the things that people ask us to do, because that is a dead end that will only only get you to be good at a thing that can easily change, that only gives you a grounded feet on something where the bottom can fall out. We have to always be expanding. And when we do, we set ourselves up to be able to better identify what the next opportunity is when things change. So when we look at how to expand in that way and add to our skill set, are we looking for new and innovative ideas or things that may parallel with what we're currently doing? I think that that's up to you. I think that it is a useful place to start by thinking if you are in a career or a field where you see 
pathways of advancement and you are interested in pursuing them, it's worth being really attentive to what skills do you need to develop next. I was always very attentive to that when I was looking at my own career unfolding. I was thinking, what skills do I have as an editor? What skills don't I have as an editor? What do I need to do? And how can I, frankly, get them faster? I thought about that a lot. So for example, for me, and this is specific to the media world, but that's my background is the media world. When I was a junior editor at uh, my first national magazine job was at Men's Health. So I was a junior editor at Men's Health, and I was mostly editing smaller stories. And I knew one of the things that I needed to do was to become better at longer stories. And Men's Health wasn't really giving me enough opportunities because there were lots of people above me who were getting those opportunities, and they weren't going to let the kid write all these big, long stories. So you know what I did? I just started writing them for other people. I started writing longer pieces for other magazines in a freelance capacity. I started to figure out how I could develop myself as an editor and a storyteller in other ways, because I was recognizing this is the next skill that I need to develop. And then when I took a new job and I, and I've, I've moved jobs many, many times, I basically, every time, you know what I do is every time that I, um, every time that I've ever taken a job or thought about leaving a job, it's because I'm asking myself two questions. Question number one is what do I need to learn? And question number two is have I learned it? And so when I went to Men's Health, what did I need to learn? Well, I needed to learn a whole bunch of things that Men's Health was really good at teaching me in terms of working at a national level and editing these kind of very tight, um, tightly packaged things that Men's Health was really good at. But I wasn't getting other opportunities there. So eventually I looked at myself and I said, well, have I learned it? Yes, I have learned it. Well, then I have to go. I have to go somewhere else where I can learn new things. It's the reason why I kept switching jobs. What do I have to learn and how and have I learned it? And so when you start to think this way, you start to recognize the things that you need to know next and you start to accelerate your timeline for learning them so that you can accelerate the growth of your career. But that's not to say that everything that you do has to be linear like that. Some things can be totally asymmetrical where you might say, you know, I would just be really delighted to take more seriously this thing that I'm interested in. And let's just use, I don't know, public speaking as an example. Let's say that you're in a role in which public speaking is not really demanded of you at all, and it may never be demanded of you, but you find it interesting. You've seen people speak on stage, and you found that to be compelling, and you realize that you're not very good at it. Then when words come out of your mouth, they sound kind of stammering, whereas in other people's mouths, they sound pretty good. And you think, wouldn't it be good to know how to do that? Fantastic. Pursue that. Take classes. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Why? Because maybe you will develop that skill, or maybe you'll just develop the skill of doing new things, which is valuable by itself and will take you to places that you just cannot anticipate. And also, you'll learn skills that you will start to apply in ways that you cannot anticipate. So maybe because you took public speaking skills, isn't it funny? As I say public speaking, I'm like, I'm stammering on that. As you take public speaking classes, maybe you become more commanding and convincing in meetings. Maybe you become better at interviewing for other jobs. Maybe you start to be able to represent your company or your industry at industry events, which raises your profile, which completely changes your career. You cannot know what is going to be an, ahead of you until you actually put yourself in a position of developing those new skills and then playing out how they impact you. So it isn't prescriptive in terms of whether or not this is something that you know you need or rather that or, or or whether it's just something that you are interested in but either way push yourself because nobody else will well on that note we're going to pause here for a quick break we've been speaking with Jason Pfeiffer in regards to his new book Build for Tomorrow we'll be right back after these messages Are you a coffee lover who wants to make a difference? Look no further than Fire Department Coffee, a veteran-owned business that gives back to support first responders in need. Each batch of coffee is freshly roasted right here in the USA by a dedicated team of first responders and coffee experts. So when you enjoy a cup of Fire Department coffee, you're not only drinking high-quality coffee, you're supporting members of your community. 
start your day with a coffee that gives back, visit firedepartmentcoffee.com. That's firedeptcoffee.com. Are you looking to entangle life's riddles? Discover the profound teachings of Dr. Shai Tabali, renowned philosopher, best-selling author, and your guide to self-empowerment. With methods that harmonize psychological and spiritual principles, Dr. Tabali's wisdom offers a pathway to holistic transformation. Take that first step today and join thousands globally and embrace the journey to higher consciousness. Visit shytabali.com. That's S H A I T U B A L I.com now. Are you chasing profitability yet losing fulfillment? Let me introduce you to your solution, The Relaunch Company. I'm Hillary DeCesar, an entrepreneurial performance coach, fearless leader of The Relaunch Company, here to help put the pedal to the metal and relaunch your business your way. Visit www.therelaunch.com. Take the free quiz to learn three steps towards waving goodbye to burnout and hello to success. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with our special guest, Jason Pfeiffer, who's here to share with us his new book, Build for Tomorrow, an action plan for embracing change, adapting fast, and future-proofing your career. Before we went for break, we were talking about what it takes to future-proof your career. And it seems in many ways, you've done that yourself. Yeah, but I also created the job that I have right now based on the skills that I wanted to develop, right? It's not like I went out and I found the exact right skills and then they were the set of keys that unlocked the right door for me. Instead, what happened was that I spent a lot of time building myself for opportunities that I didn't exactly know how to define. But I had also programmed myself to always be thinking about what new opportunities are available because I am doing something. Right. So as soon as I became editor in chief of this magazine, for example, I thought, what are the opportunities that are available now that go beyond just doing a good job at the job that I have? And the answer was fascinating because the answer was that, well, I could establish myself as an authority in a field. And if I do that, I will have a following and I could write a book. And what will the book do for me? Well, the book, I guess, could also then lead to speaking opportunities. And the speaking opportunities could lead to consulting. And the consulting could lead to, right? You see what I'm doing? I'm trying to think through how one opportunity leads to the next and then taking very seriously what it would mean to go down that path. And we can all do this at any time. But if we don't go through that exercise, then we don't have theses on what growth looks like. And if we don't know what growth looks like, well, then we may never pursue growth to begin with. And I really love, I really love, and I've always done this throughout my career, having a plan and then having a plan to abandon the plan. Right, all those things that I just said there. Some of uh, some of them I do. Some of them I don't exactly do. I'm not really a consultant, but I like to game out what next steps could look like, and then move towards them, knowing that the 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 important thing, the important thing in moving toward goals is not the goal itself. Right? We 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 spend a lot of time talking about goals, but I think that goals are not actually about the destination of the goal. The Goals 
are really just an excuse to move towards something. It's just about the movement. It's about having an idea, a direction to go in. If you're lost in the woods, the thing you should not do is wander aimlessly in a circle. You'll never get out. You need to have some direction to go in. But that doesn't mean that it's the right direction. It's just a direction. It's somewhere to go. And then along the way, you will stumble upon some new information that might inform how you are going to then change the direction. If you're in the woods, for example, you might pick a direction to go in, you go for a while, and just because you're walking due north doesn't mean that when you hit a river that you should cross it and keep going north. Maybe instead you should follow the river. And the same thing is true in careers. Have an idea of where it is that you go, but as you're moving, you will gather new information, you will discover new things about yourself, and you will say, oh, maybe actually this is what I should be doing. Let me pursue that a little bit more. And in doing so, you don't limit your options. I remember interviewing Malcolm Gladwell a while ago. Malcolm Gladwell, of course, best-selling author, podcaster, et cetera. And he told me this really fascinating thing. We were talking about what I had asked him, what makes a Malcolm Gladwell story? Like, you know, what, what makes a Malcolm Gladwell project? Everything that he does is so distinctive. So what makes that? How does he decide what a Malcolm Gladwell project is? How does he say yes or no to something? And he said, to the best of his ability, it's impossible not to do this fully, but to the best of his ability, he tries never to define who he is or what he does. Why? Because he said to him, he said to me, and these he said these words, and I immediately wrote them down on a sticky note and stuck them on my wall. I would encourage you to do the same. He said, self-conceptions are powerfully limiting. Self-conceptions are powerfully limiting. The idea being that if you have a too narrow definition of what it is that you do and who you are, then you will turn down all these opportunities that don't match that narrow definition of self. And what we need to do is instead walk through the world with a very broad definition of ourselves. There are lots of things that we could do. There are lots of directions that we could come across. We should commit ourselves to some of them, and we should just explore or experiment with others. And we'll know the difference as we keep going. But this is the reason why I like to set a goal and and also, you know, have a plan to abandon them, or uh, you know, have a, have a plan and then have a plan to abandon the plan, because I want to have a sense of where it is that I could go and things that I could do to get me there, and I will do those things. But the doing of those things are going to reveal additional opportunities that I didn't foresee that might actually be better than the initial goal that I stated, and I want to give myself the freedom and flexibility to pursue those too. Did you ever try something that you got into and thought, gosh, I really don't like this, and then use that information for like more data for moving forward? Oh, yeah, all the time. I've done, <laughs> I, I mean, I've done so many things that I don't think were all that useful, but they helped me refine an idea of what it was that I wanted to do. And I think that that's, Great. I I mean, I don't know. I'll give you I'll I'll give you um an example. For a while, I had this idea that I would be a comedy writer. And um, and you know, and I, I got a few pieces. Like uh, the New York Times ran a comedy piece of mine in their op-ed section. It was a lot of fun. And I devoted a lot of time and energy to this, and I started to game out what it was that I would. What, like, if I got good at this, if I started to write a lot of comedy pieces and get them published and started to establish myself as a comedy writer, where could I go with that? You know, I started to think about it, to look at, well, what's the pathway for people like that? You know, it's it's a lot of like, you well, you know, I could become a writer for a late night show. I could, um, I could write joke books. I don't know. There are a bunch of random things that I could do. I, I don't know that I, those things, th- th- those outcomes didn't really excite me. But also, you know what? Turns out <laughs> I wasn't that great as a comedy writer. I had a couple pieces published, but I had a lot of pieces rejected. And I just wasn't coming up with ideas at a clip that I could see other people who are successful at this doing. And eventually I realized, you know, this isn't really for me. And I'm not really that good at it. It's a fun idea, but it isn't the intersection of what I'm interested in and what I'm good at, which I think is an important intersection for us all to find. What is the intersection of what we're 
interested in and what we're good at. And yet, I didn't think, well, this was an embarrassing diversion. This was a waste of time. And why did I publish those things? Instead, I thought, well, you know what I have done in this time in which I entertained and explored the idea of being a comedy writer? What I've done is I have taught myself quite a bit about how to integrate comedy into other kinds of writing. Like now I know how to write a joke and that joke can be pretty useful. It's not going to be useful in just writing pure comedy because I'm not going to do that. I'm not good enough to do that. But let me see how else this can be useful. And I found that in other forms of writing, like for example, you know, the things that I've been telling you so far are, you know, they, they sound quite earnest and they are, they are earnest. And the way that I'm delivering them is earnest. But when I write this stuff, I often sprinkle jokes in. And the reason I do it is because I want to create a moment of levity or because I want to create a nice flow of something, you know, reading 700 words of a column straight when it's just incredibly earnest can feel monotone in a way. Like there's a monotone of earnestness. And so I like to be able to sprinkle a joke in to subvert expectations a little bit to utilize that skill that I had honed, but in a just totally different way to a totally different outcome. Large companies will hire me and pay me a lot of money to come in and talk to their teams, and I give them these these talks that are that are functional and that are really useful and that are designed to give them frameworks to navigate the changes in front of them. But I also want to make them laugh because making them laugh means that the thing that I'm saying goes down easier. It's a little more enjoyable. It's more fun. The time passes faster. And so that's a way in which I stepped back and I thought, what do I have and how can I use it? And sometimes the things that we have are used in ways that we hadn't exactly anticipated. That's okay, because what matters really is just that we recognize that we have them. And once we have something, we can use it in some infinite way. I think that's fascinating. I mean, you have so much great information in your book. Where do you think people really kind of get hung up? I think they get hung up in a lot of different ways. I mean, one of the things that we tend to do to ourselves is that we we are so human. And, you know, there's decades of psychological research that will confirm just very human things. Like for example, loss aversion theory. Loss aversion theory is is this reality confirmed, like I said, by decades of psychological research that we will naturally protect against loss more than we will pursue gain. This is just a human thing that we do. We are so concerned about what we are losing that we will make decisions oriented around protecting against the thing that we don't want to lose more than pursuing the gain. And th- this can this can lead us to make irrational decisions. And it's it's also the reason why I think that change often so often leads to panic because you know, consider what we've done. What we've done is change happens. We immediately think of the thing that we have that's comfortable, that's familiar, that we are now going to lose as a result. And then we want to know what happens next. So we start to extrapolate the loss. We say, because I'm losing this, I'm going to lose that. Because I'm losing that, I'm going to lose this other thing. Very quickly, we start to imagine that everything we know is gone. And that feels like panic. And so instead, what we need to do is we need to figure out how to extrapolate the gain. Stop extrapolating the loss. Extrapolate the gain. And what does that look like? Well, you know, I'll I'll tell you a a funny story. I, I love history. And the reason I love history is because the story has been told, right? Which is to say, we don't know how our own story plays out. We don't know how the decisions that we make today or that we make as a culture today are going to play out. We can hypothesize, people can people can be hyperbolic, but we don't really know. Nobody really knows. But you look back at history and you can see actually what happened. And so one of my favorite little moments of the history of innovation, which I'm totally fascinated by, 
is this. So uh, in the, the late 1800s, the dawn of recorded music, a phonograph is introduced. The phonograph is basically like the first record player. And it was fascinating, you know, here for the very first time, consider it, the very first time in human history, you could hear music without a human being performing it in front of you. Right up until then, the only way to hear music was to have a human being perform it in front of you, to play an instrument in front of you. Now suddenly a machine could do it. It was mind blowing. People didn't believe that it worked at first. They thought that maybe a band was hiding behind a wall somewhere, but eventually they did believe it and they loved it. You know who hated it? Musicians. Musicians hated it because they, of course, saw themselves being replaced by machines, something that we still worry about in different capacities today. And the leader of the resistance was this guy named John Philip Sousa. John Philip Sousa was a very famous composer at the time. He is the author of Military Marches that you are still familiar with today. That's John Philip Sousa. John Philip Sousa, he wrote this incredible piece. So it's just, it's so worth looking up. It's called The Menace of Mechanical Music. It ran in Appleton's magazine in, I think, 1906 or seven. And he makes all these arguments against recorded music. He was capturing what a lot of people like him were feeling at the time. And one of his arguments goes like this He says, when you introduce the phonograph, recorded music, when you introduce the phonograph into people's homes, it will replace all forms of live music performance. So why would somebody play a guitar or a piano or something inside the home when now a machine could do it for them? So it will replace all forms of live music. And because mothers usually sing to their children, and now all live music performance is gone, mothers will not sing to their children anymore. And because children grow up imitating their mothers, and now the mothers are no longer singing, the children will instead grow up to imitate the machines. And thus, we will raise a generation of machine babies. This was his argument, an actual argument from a very smart and talented person. And people believed it. Why? Because they were extrapolating loss. Because he was seeing how one thing was changing and he was imagining that it would create only loss the loss of live performances in the home. And then he was extrapolating it out because this is going to change. This other thing is going to change because that other thing is changed, changing. That other thing is going to change. And suddenly you have nothing. Suddenly you have panic. But of course, that's not what happened. So what would have happened if instead John Philip Sousa extrapolated gain? What if instead he asked three things, three questions? Please ask these questions of the change that you experience next. Here are the questions. Number one, what is changing? Pretty straightforward. Number two, what new habit or skill am I learning as a result? And then number three, how can that be put to good use? I mean, think about it for John Philip Sousa. Number one, what is changing? Well, we are listening to music on record players instead of just live. All right. Number two, what new habit or skill are we learning as a result? Well, people are learning that they have more control over their audio environment. They are no longer bound by just whoever happens to be in town performing at a specific time. They can listen to whatever music they like, and they can do it whenever they like. That's liberation. Number three, how can that be put to good use? Well, if you're John Philip Sousa, the answer should be pretty clear at this point. The answer is record your music and sell it because it's an unbelievable opportunity to get your music to more people faster than you can travel to them. John Philip Sousa used to only be able to perform for people he could travel to, and that meant that he was actually very limited in his own ability to reach people. John Philip Sousa, in opposing recorded music, was actually protecting a system that limited his own economic opportunity. That doesn't make sense, but he did it because he feared change and because he extrapolated loss. And when he stopped doing that, which he eventually did, because John Philip Sousa realized eventually, too late, by my estimation, but eventually that he could make money off of this, that other musicians were making money off of this. 
Oh, he changed his tune to be punny. And he started to record and he started to perform on the radio, which he also had refused to do at some point. And he reached, like I said at the beginning, the wouldn't go back moment where he discovered that this change that he feared was actually the opportunity that he had been waiting for the whole time. That wouldn't go back moment is available to all of us all the time. It just is. But to get there, we're going to have to stop extrapolating loss and we're going to have to start extrapolating gain and start to imagine what value is coming from change so that we can start to move towards it. It's so interesting. In your book, you talk about new normal and the normal we're at, the new normal. And it constantly seems to be in a cycle in many ways. You know, we're we're in our normal looking at the new normal. How do people get to this place where they can let that fear go and really embrace a new set of change and and, uh, thought processes? Uh, One of the most important things that you can do is also going to be the most simple. And this came to me from a really brilliant woman named Katie Milkman, who is a professor at Wharton and studies behavioral change. And I had asked her a similar question to you. What is something that people could just do right now to start to explore the value of something new in front of them? And she said, it's going to sound pat, but the answer is experiment. Because the thing is, we often think about new things as if they are long-term commitments. We think that doing this new whatever, trying this new whatever, taking this new job, moving to this city, whatever the case is, that this is a long-term commitment that we are locking ourselves in. And as a result, of course, we don't really want to do those things because we are afraid of the long-term commitment, not because we're commitment folks, because we just don't know if it's a good idea. And so as a result, we just kind of try to get out of it, to not try it at all. And Katie said, One of the best things that we can do is to just reframe that decision in our head. It's not a long-term commitment. It is a experiment. Think about it as an experiment. Say to yourself, this is an experiment. Give the experiment some terms. This is something I'm going to do for the next three months, whatever the case is. And then you go into it with a totally different set of expectations because now this is no longer about whether or not this works out for you. An experiment doesn't have to work. The point of an experiment is not success. The point of an experiment is data. The point of the experiment is just to see what happens. And maybe the experiment is a success, or maybe the experiment is a failure. But you learn something either way. You learn what you like, or you learn what you don't like. And those are both useful insights. So experiment. That is the first thing that we can really do once we have a change in front of us. And we have to do something. And it seems scary, but it doesn't have to be as long as we reframe exactly what we're getting into. So how do we get to this place where we really embrace change? You know, our brains are like, hey, there's change happening. I'm seeing this more as a positive event. How do we get to this place of embracing that? Well, The way that you do it is that you do it. I mean, it's that sounds like a punt, but also I think anybody who has ever navigated some kind of change and come out on the other side of it will recognize that it just becomes easier the more that you do it, the more that you can prove to yourself that good things will come from it. I remember standing on, you know, we talked about public speaking a little bit earlier. I remember standing on the side of this stage the very first time that I was ever going to give a keynote talk. This was maybe 2006, Scottsdale, Arizona. I'd flown out there. I'd been invited to talk. I was opening up for Marcus Lemonis, this guy from CNBC's The Prophet. And I had never done anything like this. I never stood in front of a audience of people and just talked for 20 or 30 minutes or whatever it was. And I came up with a talk and I practiced it and I practiced it and I practiced it, but I didn't know if it was going to be any good. I didn't know if the audience would like me. I I just, I didn't know anything. 
I was really scared. But I was doing it. The reason I was doing it was to go back to things that I was saying earlier because I it was opportunity set B. I wanted to know what would happen if I pursued this line of work. But that didn't make it easy, made it scary. And so I was standing on the side of the stage and there's this guy and he's introducing me. And I'm trying to think to myself, what is it that I can say to myself that will just get me on the stage (laughs) that will just make this experience make some sense? I was so nervous. And then something hit me. A thought hit me. And that thought was, I can't wait to do this the second time. I can't wait to do this the second time. Because, you know, I came to realize that if, if if I think of this as make or break, the stakes are very high. I go out on this stage. I don't know what I'm doing. It better be really damn good or else it is a disaster. That That makes it impossible to get out on that stage. But if instead I think the point of this is actually just to do it again, like the whole point of this is just to learn so that next time it's better. Because I don't know how to do this. Here I am standing on this stage. I don't really know how to do the thing I am about to do. But in 20 or 30 minutes, as soon as it's done, I will know so much more. I will know so much more than I do right now. And the only way to get there is to go out and do it. So I can't wait to get to the second time. That's the whole point of this. That changes the dynamics. That changes the way that I feel about the work that I am about to do. It lowers the stakes, just makes it about the experience. It makes it about what comes next. And that is part of the answer. Because we will have, we have, you have right now these changes in front of you. And you don't know what the stakes are or how it's going to feel. And so what you do is maybe you avoid it or maybe you wait until the very last second. Maybe you find some way out. But what if instead you just say to yourself, this is new. This is scary. Can't wait to get to the second time. First time is going to suck. Going to be uncomfortable. But I got to do it because I just have to learn what it's like. I have to not be the novice. And that means there's only one way out and that's through. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to get to the second time. And once you're there, you know so much more. Well, Jason, I know you have this great podcast. I'd love to hear more about your show. Oh, yeah. Thanks. So I have a podcast. I'd love for people to check it out. It's called Help Wanted. And Help Wanted is a host is, is a show that I host with my friend Nicole Lappin, best-selling money expert. And we bring on people who have work problems, sticky work problems, and then we talk them through a solution. It is very much like the it's like the most supportive work call-in show you've you've ever heard where Nicole and I, we we spill it all out, our own failures, our own problems, our own lessons and solutions. But we are helping people through everything from big career changes to difficult conversations with their boss. And then there are also times where Nicole and I just work through our own challenges. There was an episode recently where Nicole, you know, Nicole and I are building this company together. And uh sales calls have really given her a lot of anxiety. And so we talked through why they're making her so anxious and got to this emotional core of what it was that was so hard about making these kinds of calls. And that is that is the core of what we want to do with Help Wanted. People need help and you are facing situations right now that feel difficult, impossible. You don't know the answer. And I guarantee whatever you're facing, tons of other people are facing too. And that's the reason why we have the conversations that we have. So anyway, you can find it wherever you get podcasts. It's called Help Wanted. Well, Jason, where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? Yeah. So first of all, the book that we've been talking about as a reminder is called Build for Tomorrow. 
And you can find Build for Tomorrow wherever you get books. There's the audio book you find on Amazon, Audible, uh, um, uh, whatever. Uh, you can get it in ebook. You can get it in hardcover. Uh, uh, you know, again, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, your local bookstore, whatever. So Build for Tomorrow is the book. Help want podcast. And then otherwise, I would say the um, the, the the other thing that you can do is just find me on social media, reach out. Um, I'm on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, and I, um, I would love to hear from you. I promise I will respond to your DM. Well, Jason, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Oh, well, thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, thank you, Jason. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Build for Tomorrow an action plan for embracing change, adapting fast, and future-proofing your career. Build for Tomorrow is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, just ask for them to order it. Make sure to drop by Jason's website at Jason Pfeiffer, that's Jason, F-E-I-F-E-R, dot com. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.